The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. A show for all who are on the journey to discover the truths about their identity, history, culture, politics, spirituality, and family relationships. This is a show for the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Generation and the Hip Hop Generation, including Black Lives Matter and associate activists, all of whom are seeking change. Dr. Obatashaka and his guest are dropping knowledge and insight from his successful organizing, research, writings, and innovative thoughts, the best of which have piped into God's mind to lift you up higher and higher. To the bosses, OGs, rappers, influencers, and those looking to evolve from the constraints of misinformation and miseducation to build a foundation for personal growth, love, and mental freedom. Check out the wisdom of the OR. Yeah, that's the original revolutionary, Ova T, who inspired a million black men with his rousing speech at the Million Man March, and who continues to fight, write, and speak the truth. Dr. Oba Tashaka is one of the deepest deep thinkers in the world today. A quote by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Dr. Oba Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, was the best leader organizer in the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. An endorsement from Dr. George Wiley, Associate Director of National CORE and the best organizer blacks produced in the 1970s as the organizer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Good morning. This is the fifth of a series of the Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. And the topic for this show is the anti-Trump vote and expression of black love. This show is part two of a previous show with Dr. Siri McDougall. This show will focus on the role of the black vote in defeating Trump with a focus on the connection between the black family and black marriage rates and black voting rates and other things even more important. For this discussion, we need a male female interaction. I could think of no person better suited and prepared for this topic than Sister Favia Kujachagalia. To balance this discussion out, our second guest is Dr. Siri McDougall. I first want to introduce uh, our two guests. Sister Kujachagalia um, is a griot, uh, which means historian warrior scholar and spoken word musician. I should point out that um, she plays trumpet among other things. She, Fabia Kujichagalia is a true Renaissance woman who for the last 40 years has used education and the arts to fight racism as well as all forms of social injustice. A former professor of ethnomusicology and African civilizations at Stanford University and World College West, Sister Kujitagalia has been recognized as one of the kings and queens of Black consciousness, along with Dr. Cornell West, Sonia Sanchez, and Mariri Baraka. In 2002, she was a Culture and Spirituality Committee member of the United States delegation to the Second World Con Conference Against Racism uh, in the Caribbean country of Barbados. In addition to advocating for prisoners' rights for nearly 20 years, Sister Kujichagalia taught language and performance arts through Arts and Corrections and the California Department of Corrections at DVI, Folsom, Soledad, and San Quentin Prison for people who don't live out here, those are uh, serious uh, prisons where you have a lot of 
black men incarcerated and she's dedicated a good part of her life to teaching at that level. She has performed and lectured extensively throughout the continental United States, the Caribbean and England. Sister Kujichagalia's latest book is titled Recognizing and Resolving the Roots of Racism. And I should point out, I have, I think it's her earliest book that presents her in all of her beautiful majesty. Right here, Recognizing and Resolving Racism, a Survival Guide for Humane Beings, Volume One. <laughs> Her picture is frozen on the screen. What I also want to say about Sister Kujichagalia is that um, she's a revolutionary, as, as this uh, statement notes. And of, of all of her qualities, that's the one that I admire most, her creativity, but her commitment to change and justice for African people and people worldwide. And I'm proud to have had her as a student of mine many years ago. And as a professor, you always, at least when I first started, my goal, as I told Dr. McDougall, was that after the FBI tried to deny me tenure, my goal, it wasn't because of the FBI, my goal was to radicalize all my students. I don't think I radicalized her. She radicalized herself. But my dream was that all my students be revolutionaries. And I found out later that wasn't going to happen. Well, Sister Favia is uh, one that I'm really proud of. I mean, this is a fighting sister. She's also a member and leader in the All African People's Revolutionary Party. So we're going to be treated to a brilliant mind. Um, the second guest we had on uh, last week, Dr. Siri McDougall III. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Pan-African Studies, California State University, Los Angeles. He received his BS in sociology from Loris College in Iowa. Additionally, he has an MA in uh, Africana Studies mm -hmm. at State University of New York at Albany, uh, New York, and a PhD in African American Studies from Temple University in Philadelphia. Dr. Siri McDougall is also the co-director of the Afrometrics Research Institute. And as I pointed out before, uh, Dr. McDougall was hired as my replacement when I retired uh, in 2005 and has proven himself to be um, an outstanding scholar. And in our last uh, interview, we covered uh, part of his book on black men's studies here, um, which is entitled Black Men's Studies, Black Manhood and Masculinities in the US Context. And we'll be picking up a discussion on uh, that as well. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is lay a foundation for this uh, discussion this morning we just had the announcement of the victory of the defeat of the Donald. Um, and Blacks play a big part in that defeat. And that's very important because with him in office, just COVID-19 would mean death for many, many people. Because this is a man who just didn't have a plan, but said he didn't plan to have one. Uh, not to mention his vicious racism, um, his ignorance, and a whole bunch of other things. So what I want to do is just give you a background for this discussion, uh, which is centering on the anti-Trump Black vote and expression of Black love. So what I want to do is set a background here. In an overall sense, um, this, this is needed because Black resistance uh, to oppression is based on Black love. So that's the first connection between Black love 
the black vote and black resistance in general. Our movements for liberation have been driven uh, by love and um, love of God, love of the mighty spirit, which is God, love of our families, love of ourselves and love of our people. And much of the reason that you saw a large lineup of black people lining up to vote under circumstances in which they shouldn't have had to line up and you saw a lot of other people lined up as well was because Trump had offended some very basic principles of African-American culture expressed through the black family. The second reason that the anti-Trump vote or the movements for liberation that black people have mounted are expressions of black love is because our resistance movements are acts of culture and they draw upon the deepest thoughts and values of African, what I call new African, African-American or black people in this country and African people around the world because our values are African based. The institution that's a very house of black love is the black family and it's varied forms. That is two parent households, extended families, extended family communities, uh, extended relationships, because now we have a lot of people who are into long-term relationships. However we define it, the black family is the bedrock and foundation of African and African-American culture. And I wanna say this culture that Africans in this country have is the popular culture of the United States and the popular culture of the world. And we often underestimate it. It is our great strength. The lessons and truths learned in the black or African-American family inspires us not only to pick up the vote, to march, to boycott, when necessary to pick up the gun in self-defense, it focuses us on freedom. And one of the key messages that comes out of our culture and especially the black family is the message of freedom. And um, it's a different definition of freedom than Europeans have. Theirs is arbitrary. When they have power, they can do whatever you want. And that's what the Donald did. And that's what whites have been doing since they've been in control and are now losing it for 300 years. Black people, when we talk about freedom, we mean discipline first, and we learn that in the family, and then freedom. And so you can't be free unless you're disciplined. And so this is one of the things that we bring to bear on any movement that we bring about. Our parents tell us to know what we're talking about and speak the truth. Don't open your mouth and just let anything float out like the Donald. It is the love between black men and black women manifested in our relationships and our families that is the foundation, you no know, reason for black unity. It's, it's, it's the unity of black men and black women first in family, social, love, friendship relationships that is really the key to the unity that black people display throughout all aspects of our culture. And we might question that because it's hard to get us unified. But whenever we stand together, and of course, first we do in the family, then there is no unity in this country stronger than black unity. And when I'm talking about that, there is no group that bonds together more totally than we do. And this is something uh, that we understand. And it puts us in a very important strategic position when others are divided and almost always others, including whites are. Uh, so this bond of unity is based on love. And believe it or not, black people have one of the highest marriage rates percentage wise, that is the number of black males and females who marry each other. That's the part I'm talking about. The second highest in the country, um, whites have the highest, but we'll see in a minute the weaknesses of that family formation. So it's the unity that we find expressed at the foundational level of the family 
that explains the unity that we find in the larger black community and that it gives us this strength. So if we are to understand the anti-black vote against Trump as an expression of black love, then we need to understand that there is a direct relationship between the black vote, love, black resistance movements in general. The percentage of the overall black vote comes very close to black marriage patterns. And I might point out the percentage of um, the number of, you know, the, the percentage of males and females in the family um, also corresponds to the level of support that blacks generally display for resistance movements, not only through their vote. So we know that first of all, uh, since 1865, to 1968, 75% of all black families had a husband and wife in them. Blacks from 1865 to 1968 had a higher marriage rate than whites, even though uh, we had less material things to sustain that marriage rate. And at the same time, that unity that we find in the Black family corresponds to the unity that we find in Black political struggles. For example, at a time in 1955, the Montgomery bus boycott, when Blacks stood up against segregation, 97% of Blacks stood and supported uh, the end of segregation in the South, particularly in busing. At that time, 75% of black men and women stood together. So the unity of the family was translated into the unity uh, in struggle. What we know today is that in black marriage patterns, there's a common assumption that the black male has deserted the black female. But if we look at the marriage rates and percentages of black men and black women that marry each other, and this is based on black demographics research, 85% of black men marry black women. For those of you that think that the black man has left the black woman, 93% of black women marry black men. And so of course that indicates that the sister is even more loyal to us than some brothers are to her, but the difference between these two is very small. Now, what's interesting is in black voting patterns, what you find is that um, they follow what's happening in the family. Uh, for example, when it comes to um, the uh, black voting patterns, we find that in the uh, current election, uh, while 85% of men marry black women, um, that 80% of black men voted for Biden. There's a 5% difference between the vote and the marriage rate. Now, you know, we're going to discuss this particularly why it is that 80% of black men voted for Biden when more have in the past. That's a subject that will be discussed in a while. But what's important is to note that there's a correlation between the percentage of black males who are married to black females and the percentage of blacks who exercise their vote intelligently. <laughs> this might indicate that there's some relationship between what we get in the family and what we do in the community. Similarly, if we look at black women, 93% of black women marry black men and 91% Black women voted for Biden. So again, the marriage rate and the politics, they follow together. The key point to make is this also, that when it comes to whites, this um, unity does not hold up as well. And this is why uh, Biden is in the White House. Whites are always split 
they are always divided. And so if we look at uh, this election, 58% of white men voted for Trump, 40% voted, voted for Biden. 55% of white women voted for Trump, 43% voted for Biden. By the way, a larger percentage of black uh, white women voted for Trump this time than they did the last time. I mean, the last time he was caught doing all kinds of sexual things and they still went and voted for him, but even a greater percentage voted for him when you had a viral attack that was just killing people right and left. Uh, so the point is black power is expressed through this black unity that's manifested in the black family and expressed throughout the society. So to end this opening, I just wanna make the point there would be no Trump in the white, uh, a, a Biden in the White House right now, but for the unity of black people. But for the fact that Biden served as vice president to a black president, gave black people the reason in South Carolina to go behind him and support him. And that lifted a losing candidate to a winning position. And it then dictated that Biden needed to reward his most loyal base that had saved him from oblivion by picking a black woman for vice president. Now we can talk about how they were not the ideal candidates and they by, by far were not. But what we under, have to understand is the mandate coming out of the black family and the black community was defeat Trump and that we needed to put someone out there that would be better than him. And so this was the wisdom of the black grassroots. And so if we look at this outcome of this election right now, it is the solid wall of black votes that have come out of Pennsylvania, solid wall of black votes that have come out of Georgia, solid wall of black votes that have come out of Michigan, and of other areas in the Midwest, Blacks have been decisive, along with Latinos and Native Americans. But this has been the strongest one because Blacks understand strategic power. And if you get a chance, go to the uh, series that I did, the one that I did on uh, lessons from Black post-Reconstruction, voting Trump out of the White House into the jailhouse. And I show you how Black power has been exercised through history, through us playing the role, the strategic role of balance of power. And so we won the Civil War. 170 odd thousand black men won the Civil War and emancipated blacks. We did the same thing with the black freedom movement that dismantled formal legal apartheid. And while Trump did everything to steal this vote, and to intimidate black people, which they did in 1876. They literally killed black people out of the ballot box. Even before federal troops were withdrawn in 1876, black people stood up then. But as I pointed out in that presentation, which you need to check out, is that the tide of history is now in our favor. Trump feels that he's dispossessed and he really has been dispossessed. He's been dispossessed of the presidency. <laughs> He's been dispossessed of formal power. And so now you're gonna hear the mouth, the mouth of Trump as he faces federal prosecution, New York prosecution, and IRS prosecution. You know, IRS played the role of sending Al Capone to the jail. One thing you don't wanna do is cross the IRS. I know brave people, black belts in karate, that when they go before an IRS audit, they give up all their money. I tell them, don't do that. Just give them the documentation. You don't have to pay anything. So the thing is, we have taken Trump and we have taken him out of the White House and we, he, we're preparing him for the jailhouse and he is moaning and groaning right now. He can appeal all he wants. This is a sweep and you, the listening audience, black folks especially, and then people of color, uh, have played the most important part in this and progressive whites who uh, had enough sense to 
uh, stand on the right side of history. So that's a background for this discussion. So I want to start with um, Dr. Siri McDougall and um, I wanted to discuss with you, first of all, uh, have you to uh, explain uh, the role racism and race as a concept has played in forging African-American culture. And what are some of the ways that racism affects black males and females similarly and differently? And what are some of the ways that the impact of racism on both males and females black impacted our reaction to Trump. And, and uh, this question is particularly important because Dr. McDougall has some very insightful ideas about the way in which uh, racism particularly has Im Im impacted on black males. Siri. What's this? There I am. Okay. Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, I think that one, the impact of um, of racism. Just speaking on the impact of it um, on culture is probably the most damaging. I think the person who has like put forth that that idea that one of the most impactful uh, effects of racism is the effect it has on culture is probably uh, Kobe Kanban. Um, and it can it can have an impact on the value system. And when that happens, then it's just that's just the most damaging effect it could possibly have. But also in terms of racism can have an effect on the expression of culture, um, which are rooted in worldview. But of course, they respond to environment, shaped by, by the environment. And racism is a part of the environment, of course. And uh, when they begin, uh, when it begins to affect the, the values, value and belief systems, then it's uh, extremely problematic. But at the same time, when Black people's worldview is applied to everything in this environment, including racism, then that's where we get uh, we get the Harlem Renaissance, for example, responded to, uh, it was an expression of Black people's values and cultures, but also in much of it was, was uh, responding to racism and a new sense of self. Same thing with the Black arts movement um, and Black traditions and rituals, etc. So racism is not the determining factor, I wouldn't say, of uh, Black people's culture. But yes, I mean, it can definitely have an effect on the shaping how, shaping how our culture is expressed. But I think that when it comes to the impact of racism across gender, of course, Black men and women experience, ra <clears throat> experience racism. But it's important to, to note that it's experienced differently. So for example, if you look at a lot of the research on the experience of racism, a lot of it shows black males report experiencing uh, racial discrimination. Usually those studies lean toward black males uh, reporting experiencing racism more frequently than, uh, than black women. What does that mean? Does it mean that black males experience racism more uh, black, it's sometimes it's, it's an effect of the kind of questions that I asked, because the types of racism that black males experience are across the board, but more than black women, the racial violence and harassment black males will experience um, more of, the, of that particular type of racism. But then at the same time, black women are more likely to be ignored and misrepresented marginalized so they're experiencing more of that kind of uh, kind of racism you know so it's just important to recognize that they experience that we both experience those things but experience them differently and the same so how does that affect 
uh, voting? Well, one, I mean, because black males experience that, that sort of uh, racial violence and harassment more than women say from the police, then that's gonna shape how black males vote in particular when it comes to, buy, to, to uh, Trump and his uh, overwhelming emphasis on a punishing form of uh, criminal justice, uh, protecting the police, expanding, uh, protecting their use of force and army, et cetera. That's the kind of, uh, of racism in addition to the increase in racial hatred, racial animus at the same time that's definitely the kind of uh, racism that black males are more, um, they experience more of at the same time, his significant less regard for women's reproductive rights, um, his, and it, it, in addition to Biden's, at least, at least he, he says he's more supportive of, um, of women and his promotion of the Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, I think that uh, his, his support for, for women's health issues, I think all of those things are areas where black women also experience more discrimination in terms of their, uh, their treatment in healthcare industry and in hiring and in jobs, uh, that kind of discrimination. And I think that that definitely could play a factor and probably did play a major factor in um, shifting attitudes toward, toward Biden and away from Trump. But thank you for asking that question. It, it kind of, uh, put me in a position to, to, to tie those different things together. But I think they're definitely related. What do you think, Dr. Tshaka? Uh Yeah, I, I definitely think that they are related. And the way you link together the racism directed against Black men and then the racism directed against Black women and then just generally against Black people. But the differential one is one that's often not looked at because we know that black women historically have been exposed to things like rape, uh, which was uh, a major uh, form of exploitation, racist exploitation on the plantation and to this day and many other forms as well. So, uh, you know, I think that's important. One thing I would add is that from a historical standpoint, um, race consciousness served as the first glue that led us to see ourselves as having a common, common peoplehood. And um, it was not the essence of the culture, which is basically African adapted to America, but uh, it was at a, a central uh, formative level, race consciousness, and it distinguishes African-American culture from African-Caribbean culture simply because we're in the presence of whites and dealing with them day and night. Sister Fabia, can you hear us? So what we've, uh, so what we've uh, just done is, just done is have, a discussion have a discussion with Google on racism's differential effect in terms of this case uh, on black males and uh, black females. And you might wanna make some comments on how you see uh, racism uh, working and impacting sisters as well as brothers. I know this is your specialty, uh, sister Kujitagalia. You wanna make some comments on that? I am so sorry I missed the brother's um, statements. Please forgive me um, and, and how are you? Um, I find that specifically because the women are the ones who raise and nurture families, 
and the community. You teach something to a man, you teach a person, you teach a woman, you teach a people. So anytime racism is involved, it really is going to minimize the effectiveness of the nurturing that black women can do upon them fam upon their families and the community. And it becomes an issue many times, a dichotomy where capitalism is being pushed onto us so that our revolutionary ideology is being pushed out of us. And that's the, one of the main things that racism does. It diverts our perspective, our attention, and our uh, unity by allowing us to focus on materialism as opposed to Pan-Africanism. So we focus on things rather than our spiritual reality and being, which is what's going to actually save us as a people, not to mention the entire human race. That's, that's, that's heavy. That's heavy. And um, I think that that point you're making about the role of capitalism in that, too often that one is overlooked because sometimes we're just looking at, well, can we pack this thing up and make it better? And this COVID thing and everything else is showing you die at a higher rate because of capitalism mm. and racism. Put those two together. So that's part of what I love about you, sister, is as a revolutionary, you get to the core of the problem. And I know that many of our listeners have not yet reached that point because they think they can still make it in this system. This system is not structured for you to be free. Capitalism and racism are key reasons. Those are profound comments. Are, are there any others you wanna make on the impact that you see that racism has on sisters particularly? The nurturing is one, are there any others? Well, of, I, of course the image is all of it. Uh, racism is always that message that white psychopathy, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes wants us to believe that white is supreme. So we do everything not to look like our natural beautiful selves because we are busy accommodating white psychopathy and racism. Um, ironically, even the concept of capitalism, many people don't understand it. I was one, took me years to come to this uh, reality. A lot of that came with the help of the all African People's Revolutionary Party that capitalism is the foundation of racism. Capitalism is what created racism. And if it were not for capitalism, there probably would not have been any racism. We have become fallen under the impression that the only way that we can achieve some type of financial economic success is through capitalism. But African people had financial success hundreds of thousands of years before there was something called capitalism. And two of the wealthiest people to have ever lived on earth, wealthiest black man, King Massamusa of Mali, wealthiest black woman, Mary Ellen Pleasant, right here in San Francisco. And that had nothing to do with capitalism. What we have been focusing on in this country is materialism, material wealth. And material wealth does not replace or delete or circumvent capitalism. Mary Ellen Pleasant used all of her money to fight capitalism. We have people now who simply want money for the sake of having money, feeling like the more money I have, the better I am. This is the myth capitalism teaches us. This is the myth white psychopathy. I don't call the supreme, nothing supreme about it. This is the myth white psychopathy teaches us. And as African women, it is our job to be very clear about who we are and our purpose on the planet. We are the mothers of civilization. We are the mothers of the family. We are the mothers of the community. If we even look at the game of chess, which was invented by the Moors, black culture, the most important piece on that board is the black queen. That is what everyone is protecting, the black queen. And the Moors always taught us that the aggressor, the one who is always invading, is the Caucasian, which is why the white piece moves first. That proves that mythology of white invasion into black lands where the black man must now protect his black queen. And that's where we are to this day. And racism 
has gotten us so blinded to our history because it does not teach it. We have been confused. And now we are all so anxious to be born again Christian, born again capitalist. We forgot how to be born again African. <laughs> well put. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that needs to become a chant in the black church. Born again African, well put. <laughs> What we have here is also a poet. So she's gonna break it down for you in colorful, beautiful way. <laughs> uh, Sister Favy, I wanted to ask you another Sister question. Favie, I wanted to ask you another question. And um, um, Siri can also chime in on this. Um, in, in introducing this, um, I'm talking, in about introducing this, I'm talking about the black family. The black family. How it's a microcosm of African American culture. As an expert on African American culture and racism, um, black on black marriage rates are next to whites the highest in the United States, contrary to popular opinion. Even though the percentage of marriages are down, and that ain't because we don't like each other, that's become it, it's been hard for us to maintain a man and a woman in a household when either one's not got enough to support it. There's other reasons, and prison industrial complex is another reason. So the, the fact that the percentage of Blacks who are married is down, ain't because we don't want to be married. But my question is, um, given this uh, high um, um, attraction of Black men for Black women, I, in, in, in introducing this, I was pointing out that 85% uh, of Black men marry Black women, 93% of Black women marry Black men contrary to popular opinion. Uh, so what accounts for these, these high bonding of black men and black women? Um, black women. And um, also and the fact also that it, seeds, fact it seems to feed into our resistance. Into to, so what do you think about it? What's, what's the basis to these bonds? My uh, computer is giving me part of the question. I didn't hear the whole thing. Okay, let me so go back. Okay, let me go back. If Dr. Siri can uh, respond, I can start hearing hearing some context because I missed a lot of it with my computer. Okay, go ahead, Siri. Okay, go ahead, Siri. Dr. Tishaka. Yeah. Yeah. Can you re can you restate the last part of the question? The yeah. impact of, because the marriage you stated about the marriage rates, but then the question was about the impact so, of the marriage rate. Yeah. So what accounts for the um, unity, the large unity that we see greater than every other group except one in this country? That is the bonding, the largest, second largest percentage of bonding between black men and black women. It's higher, but there's is it, it, it matters other things dislike of other people in particular and dislike of self and it's not reflected in their politics they split on politics but with us we have this high bonding of black men and black women um which is extremely large i gave the numbers just a minute ago what do you think um accounts for this um what accounts for this and how is it that black male female relational unity is tied to the fact of the black vote and higher unity among blacks? What, what, what do you think accounts for this? I think one part of it is, um, one part of it is the concept of linked fate, linked fate among black people that are, that what happens to us is, is related to one another uh, that our destinies are tied to one another, and the and the fact that more central to us is racial identity, our our racial identity, our cultural identity, uh, we're more tied by who we are, and uh, less divided by class. Even though I mean the class issue is is a growing issue, but uh, for us, our racial identity trumps uh, class. It always has. Uh, been more more determining factor in who we are and and our fate. So I think that those two things are um, are definitely major factors. What do you think, uh, 
uh, uh, Sister Kujitagalia. Or I really wish we heard the answer to that one. Yeah. Okay, let me move on. I, uh, Fabio, we can't hear you. Um, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Um, Siri, in the, in the polling for the 2020 presidential election, they pretty accurately forecasted the vote for Biden. Um, and it looks like he's going to get um, a um, overwhelming majority vote, a, a large uh, majority vote uh, in the popular vote, over 52%. However, it failed to predict the power of Trump. What do you think the forecasters missed about the appeal of Trump to whites, uh, including the fact that uh, more white female voters voted for Trump in 2020 than they did in 2016. And is Trumpism a passing phenomenon or is it an ongoing one? I think that um, that as far as the white female vote, although white males have been the primary source of, uh, of sexism and patriarchy for white women, at the same time, they've also been the, um, the primary protectors of uh, white female privilege. So I think that that is a vote that, is, uh, that was cast in favor of protecting, um, protecting that, that racial, race, gender privilege that white women enjoy. And the second, the second part of the question. Uh, anyway. Why do you think they missed the appeal of Trump to whites? They had pretty well gauged the uh, uh, outcome for Biden in this election, but they had really missed uh, Trump's strengths. Why do you think that is? Yeah, because I think that they that they they've incorrectly cast Trump as like this because he's he's not the typical statesman, but he still embodies these uh, values, and the values have been very consistent: the competitiveness, the the um, the egocentric uh, dynamic of who he is is like a is a fundamental part of Eurocentric culture. And while they may look at him as kind of a passing phenomenon, that's one of the most, what he, what he embodies is one of the most, a few of the most consistent values of American um, society, I think. Uh, what are some of those consistent values that he embodies? Materialism, competitiveness, individualism, um, those, kind of, those kind of values, I think. And, and if it looks like, uh, I think that one, so one of the things that I think is a, is a, is a problem, generally speaking, is just looking at Trump as something that's going to go away or something that's a new phenomenon. Okay. The only thing that's really new about him really is his particular um, unstatesmanly like style. Uh -huh. Yeah, in the um, piece that I did on, um, Lessons from post reconstruction, voting Trump out of the White House into the jailhouse. I do a profile on him. And I'm a, I'm a warrior, a sister, Puja Chagalia is. I've lost no battle. And anytime I engage an opponent, I always assess their strengths and weaknesses. And I think that one of the things that happened is Trump was put in some, as you point, comical category that would go away. But when I looked at his strengths, um, and these are the reasons why he's going to be around unless they put him in solitary confinement, um, is that, first of all, uh, Trump, th there's a reason why Biden was not able to cut into Trump's base. Biden won by building a bigger base of his own, and mainly through black and brown red and yellow votes that were solid and consistent. Uh, uh, and Dr. Shaka? Yeah. Um, 
I think we have we have Sister Shakalia back. Um, oh. I want to ask if you can if you can ask your the tech man there if he can make me if he can make me the co-host. I think I can help. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, I'm barely hearing the conversation. It's cutting in and out. Um, hopefully, you can hear this. One of the things that I've noticed about Africans in the United States is that we completely underestimate the power of racism in this country. And we, for the most part, want to deny its existence. So we overlook how racist this country is, and it's not racist on its own. There are people con consciously participating in it daily. And those people live around us every day. We are living in a racist country. And the former president was somebody who embodied that racism and gave the racist hope, which is why he has such high votes. A lot of people in this country really want to protect racism because it benefits them in so many ways. Whether they articulate it or not is not the point. The reality is this country's mission is to protect racism and serve the interests of capitalism. And Trump was the perfect person who did all of that for this country. So that's why he was so well supported because America's objective is to support and protect race at all cost. To build on that. I don't know if that I got through. Add, I just mm -hmm. add. It did. Um... And I just wanted to add, I was looking at a report uh, about, again, can you see if we can make me co-host on Zoom so I can, oh, here we go. That's good. Okay, so I think that um, that I was looking at um, a report that was talking about the impact of racial inequality on the economy. And it was saying that over a trillion dollars are lost in law, law, um, are lost to the country in lost wages uh, due to racial inequality and the wealth, the wealth income gap um, in particular. And it was kind of this approach that I have noticed that, I mean, not that I've noticed, I think everybody has, has noticed this, but there's a tendency to sell um, justice, black fair treatment of black people. Oh, the country will benefit. We'll be, there'll be, we could add tr trillions of dollars to the economy by ending racial discrimination. But that is, I look at that like a receipt. Like this is the price that white people are willing to pay for um, white privilege. Yes, trillion dollars uh, that are lost to the economy. Okay, but that's a hit that they're willing to take to maintain the current uh, race power hier hierarchy, you know, so um, that's not a unfortunate outcome of racism. That is a, that's an intentional uh, price. Uh, that's a, that's the receipt for white privilege, <laughs> you know. Um, you want to move to uh, question eight, uh, Siri, acting as co-host. Can you hear me? Okay, let me uh, uh, state the question and then you can start to answer it and then she can. Question okay. eight. African-American culture and black families uh, have shaped very profound conceptions of African-American manhood and womanhood that are contrary to stereotypical portrayals of us. Siri and Kujichagalia, can you each discuss some of the forces that have shaped African-American conceptions of manhood and womanhood, describing African-American principles of manhood and womanhood? What principles guide African-American manhood and womanhood? What are some of the principles that Trump and his ideology have trampled on? I think that in particular, She's on so black men are influenced one by black uh, understanding. Uh oh. Yeah, we got it. She's back on. Feedback again. Okay. Okay. So black men are first uh -huh. influenced so by African understandings of manhood. And 
ritualized ways to emphasize wisdom, gender complementarity, uh, responsibility to the collective, spirituality, but colonization, enslavement attempted to instill within Black men a manhood defined by passivity and compliance and assertiveness only in service of white power and institutions. But instead of capitulating, I think Black men have demonstrated a masculinity of resistance and race pride, which is in addition to, in addition to like uh, Dr. Tashaka said earlier, that there's something new in this context and that's in addition to um, racial pride and resistant masculinity. But some of it's been exercised in a dysfunctional way, but I wouldn't say that that's true for the majority of Black men. But I think Trump violates Black male collective responsibility sense of self-determination because I think what he's tried to play on is to try to drive a wedge between Black men so that they see so that older black men, men or middle class black men um, see younger black men as responsible for their own victimization by police and deserving of uh, of harsh punishment and that older black men and middle class black men need protection not from white racist police but from one another so i think that he's tried to uh undermine Black uh, men's sense of collective responsibility and collective identity. Uh, you know, one of the things that I find very interesting about your research and the res uh, research of a number of others, and then my own understanding of African, African American culture, culture is, is the, the emphasis, emphasis that, your research places on um, the strength of particularly others, uh, the uh, strength that African American women exude while at the same time uh, exuding a form of femininity with strength and uh, with, um, without accepting patriarchal control in, in many cases, and particularly white patriarchal control, and resisting it in their own family and often not having to, because in a lot of cases there's support, but in others there's not. Um, but your research shows the um, sensitivity that is one of the key qualities in black manhood. Uh, you know, the quality of being nurturing and supportive, which is the main quality of black women and of womanhood in general, but that it's uh, a quality fostered in African-American culture in black males. And I found that interesting in our last discussion. You wanna make any other comments on that? And if uh, Kuji Chagalia is who hooked up, she can as well. Yeah, I think that the research shows that nurturing and, and emotionality are central to black men's definitions of manhood. And it is the, um, it's the lens that, that we've been given to look through to see black men that prevents us from seeing that, from, from seeing those different, those aspects of uh, black men. It's a part of the, it's a part of the whole concept of invisibility, I think, um, but absolutely. And you know, there was a, one particular uh, study I can recall, um, and it was about, it was actually looking at Black male fathers and um, comparing fathers, their interactions with infants. And the Black male fathers compared to the other race, racial groups of, uh, of male, of, of, of fathers, that is, different racial groups. Latinx, white, Asian, the black fathers were more likely to do the things like uh, holding, uh, the changing of diapers, and the uh, the talking to to babies, the physical contact, the things that are associated with it, with with intimacy, and what that the research has been able to do is to shed light on uh, the aspects of black manhood that go unseen. 
due to stereotypes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to bet that part of the reason for that is the continuation of African cultural patterns that are central in African American families, because those are features that you find as central to African culture and African American culture, also linked to uh, a strong sense of humanism. You know, the, the value of the human being over everything else, and then the precious life of a child or of those you're closest to. So I'm gonna bet that, in fact, I know that uh, that's a central core uh, feature of black families that are just in us. It's an eight, you know what I mean? It's an eight. And it partially explains the empathy, the greater empathy that we find with the exception maybe of Native Americans towards the sick and the old in our families, you know? And the fact that you will see, it's almost a matter of course in black families that when you have a person in the family who has one of the most debilitating illnesses that's really hard to handle, Alzheimer's, you know? Where after a certain time, the person doesn't even recognize their own family members. And uh, more often than not, We'll keep them at home and care for them, man and woman, you know? And those are, those are like core qualities of the culture that would be highly admired, you know? Beautiful, you know? Um, we discussed uh, some of this last week, uh, but I think that it bears uh, further exploring and uh, that's the small number of black men who voted for Trump. Um, you gave a partial explanation for this last week, but I think there's more to go into. How do you explain this vote? Uh, and particularly, do you see any connection between those who um, voted for Trump in addition to the wealth gap that you discussed the last time people voting um, for tax cuts, <laughs> Shaq O'Neal and others. Um, do you see any connection between the pro-Trump vote among a small number of Blacks? Because he was able to move three or 4% of young Black males into his column. Do you see any connection between that vote and the prison industrial complex? And do you see a connection between that vote and anything else that has happened to black men that might predispose them to that. And, and I'm not justifying this vote. I wanna uh, make it real clear that uh, it's kind of mad to be voting for, for, it would be like a Jew voting for Hitler. It's kind of mad, but exploring this deeper, what else is behind it? I think, uh, I was thinking about this question. And what we talked about last week, too, and while I think that there's definitely something there about this, this Trump shift right now, something specific and unique to this particular moment, at the same time, I'm a little cautious because I don't, I don't want to make too much, too much out of, out of this uh, black male vote because... Um, I mean, I think the vote for Clinton, when it was Hillary Clinton running, it, it was not too far off for an amount of black males who voted. I, well, let me see. How do I want to say? I, what I'm saying is that there's typically this gap, a gender gap in voting of about like eight, eight um, or so percent, even though smaller for, for, for black uh, people, like you said, because of how um, consistent we leave, we tend to vote, but men tend to vote conservative more than women. I mean, it has a lot to do with the nature of the things that are on the ballot and the positions the conservatives take on guns, reproductive rights, uh, compared to to Democrats on the one. So I just wanted to start with that that there's already this that there's already typically a gap. But then at the same time, to speak to um, to some of the other aspects, 
for that Trump also kind of exudes this style that I think men, uh, men maybe more of the black men maybe more receptive to one, on the one hand. And then the other thing is I think that black men are starting to realize that uh, there's some who are, who are just taking the position that, and I think you can see that in kind of Ice Cube and some of these other folks that we talk about, um, some of the remarks that they've made at least, even though I don't think that they're representative, but that neither one of them, you got one candidate that is was a major author to, uh, of the 94 crime bill. Then you got another one who is against the, uh, who, I mean, is on record for uh, view, her views about body cameras on the, on the other hand, on one hand. And then you have another candidate who has uh, taken a position of basically supporting police in the face of police abuse and has not made any significant moves toward ending that. And I think bl black men tend to vote when they see that their interests are being served. So I think in this case, I think black men, are, some black men at least are saying, hey, I don't know if my interest is served better by the other candidate or, or not. So I think that, that that traditional male vote in addition to just being feeling alienated by both parties, maybe going into some of that gap. Uh, Sister Fabia, can you hear us? No, I get her sound isn't there. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there we go. yeah. Here we go. I definitely want to chime in on that. And it, it goes back to what you were saying uh, originally, Oba. Black men, like any other men, want to take care of their families. And in a capitalist country, the way you do that is with money. So you are voting for the person who you feel can ensure your ability to have money. So a vote for Trump by a black person is not a vote for a racist in their mind. In their mind, they're voting for capitalism, enabling them to have more finances or more monetary means of being seen as, quote unquote, a man in this culture. So I don't see it as a vote for an individual. I see it as a vote for an Ideology. And his ideology is promoting capitalism. The thing that is missing is that we forget to see that capitalism is the foundation of racism. That is what is missing in our miseducation process. So voting for capitalism is also supporting white psychopathy and racism in many ways, but that connection is not seen. So there is a total disconnect when that happens. We don't see that as voting for capitalism as being a vote for anti-humanism, which it actually is. But we don't have not come to that realization yet. Mm. Good and point. Just, yeah, yeah. Just to add, I mean, black men, I, I think it was 82% it was black males voted for Trump. Trump. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Biden. 80, 80%. 80, 80%. 82% voted for Clinton. You know, that's why I'm a little hesitant to make too much on, on the, it's a 2% difference. I, I do think it's significant. I just didn't want to make too, I, that's why I'm a little hesitant to make too much of it. I think there's another reason to be hesitant is because the overwhelming number of black men and black women are on the same page. This is the exception, but the Republicans were smart enough to see that there's a little crack that they could play. They did it with the Latinos too. And the Democrats are largely to blame because they've taken blacks for granted as the other party has. This one just claimed to have a platinum plan. That might've been a ring that they give to little Wayne. That was all the platinum he was gonna get. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so I think you're right not to blow this up. And, and I think that uh, black men have largely stood uh, alongside of sisters. Sisters have just been a little bit more intelligent because <laughs> Sister Fabia comes out, you all carry the culture, you know what I mean? And what is it that keeps most black men from going outside of uh, the race? They're mamas. Mamas. In the, in the end, they realize this, and I'm gonna quote Miles Davis on this. He said, 
I used to sleep around a lot, but every time I married, I married a black woman and she was just like my mother. And I don't even know why, you know what I mean? <laughs> like Cicely Tyson, who saved the <laughs> drug behind, you know what I mean, huh? You know, so that is the bottom line. I was talking to my neighbor, Joe Levine, who was a model man, and there's a million of them around, you understand? And he said, brother, I couldn't do that. My mother would slap me from heaven. You know what I mean, huh? So there are some profound reasons why, you know, we stay on the right side. And the main thing is the sister is like your mama. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about your mama. She is the ultimate thing closest to God. I don't care how many whippings she gave you. I don't care what fault you find in her. In the end, that is the one closest to God. And I can testify. My first wife was like my grandmother because she was like the other mother. And then my second wife, Pam, who I love deeply, she's like my mama. You know what I mean? And so because I was raised in this extended family household, I had these two choices. At one point, I didn't know what was moving me. I just knew I was attracted to a woman. And then I looked later and said, oh, she just like my grandmother. You know what I mean? <laughs> so this is profound stuff because these women are giving you love. And old Shaq, now let's, now, now Shaq is another story here. Shaq, I like Shaq in, in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? I, I like the way this seven foot tall basketball player when his mama comes into that announcing room, he gets all like a boy. Yes, mama. Yes, mama. You know what I mean? And I like the fact that his first wife was black, even though it seemed like that wasn't a good match. You know what I mean? Not because she was black. They just didn't seem to match. So I like that. But come on, Shaq, just so you can make a few more million dollars, are you going to sign on to somebody who's doing your people in? Hey, we got to talk to you. You know what I mean? Because this is this ain't a case like uh, Sister Kujichagalia said, where you need the money to survive. You just want more money. You're already a billionaire. You know what I mean? So come on. You know what I mean? People first. But it, it would be a friendly discussion with Shaq because first of all, he's too big to get <laughs> too fierce with. But secondly, there's a side of Shaq I like and, and Shaq needs to be talked to. And the boy's got an EED, but you know what happens when you get these EEDs sometimes. You know what I mean? It ain't always wisdom that we get. <laughs> Sister, you missed uh, the earlier question and it was around the shaping of um, black manhood and black womanhood and um, particularly discussing the historical forces that have contributed to the shaping of black manhood and womanhood. And, and how do you see those having worked and um, in this particular case, um, both as a black woman, but you, you've been dealing with black men most of your life and, and include- and Both I, as a I black woman, this, but you, you've been dealing with black men most of your life and, and include- and I, I, I want to say this, but this is about it. Sister Kujichaga, Sister Kujichaga, Kujichaga is working in prison industrial in complex, complex that has not been always easy, not because of black men but because of the threat of prison guards, right wingers in prison, she has nearly faced death a couple of times. And yet she's bringing in that strong revolutionary femininity and poetry and beauty to black men. And so I'm just wondering, based on your experience, your study, but your life experience, how do you see these historical forces influencing the shaping of black manhood and black womanhood? And how is Trump, or as a metaphor for white racism, going against that? Because that's been one of the forces. Yeah. I see uh, this whole phenomenon bringing us closer together. Because a lot of times we like to be in denial because our culture is about justice and democracy. Those are African concepts that Caucasians have plagiarized. We are the ones who believe in democracy and justice. So when it comes for voting time, we immediately want to vote because we really believe in those things and those realities, even though they are dysfunctional as a brother said in this country, of course. 
But we do believe in justice and democracy. So, and just as much as we believe in justice and democracy, we know they are founded in this concept of unity, which is in unifying our families. So you unify your family, your community, your culture, through democracy and justice. So America throws out these words and we believe, we desperately want to believe that America is going to offer it to us. So we will participate in any activity in which we think we can achieve some form of democracy and justice, even if it's the voting process. We will go anywhere to achieve it, to get it, to win it. What we have to remember is what our brother Malcolm said, you don't take your case to the enemy to try. That's what we keep forgetting. No matter where we go, we are still on the Titanic. And it doesn't matter who is at the helm of the Titanic, we're all going down. Until we start looking at humanism, compassion, unity, all the things that are anti-America. America is based on disrespect, greed, slavery, incarceration, we have to really acknowledge that and see this country does not love us. It never will. It's no such thing as equality. And who would want to be equal to psychopathy in the first place? The reality is we have a rich culture that we have been denied in the miseducation system. That's why I love the fact, you know, when you were saying in the last show about reading, uh, like Dr. Clark said, if you're not reading, you're a traitor to your people. Mm-hmm. Sister, your your sound is going out again. Okay. So we need to be reading in spite of what is offered or given to us to read a curriculum or whatever. We need to go outside of ourselves and make it our business to find out what we need to be reading to reestablish and regain our true identity and culture. The minute we do that, we will stop trying to be Negro Americans and Negro Europeans and all those other things that take us further away from our success as humane beings. We've got to understand that when America uses the words justice, liberty, and democracy, they mean nothing as compared to when black people or other cultures use the words liberty, justice, and democracy, whole different meaning. So we vote and we participate based on those ideals, not really understanding that they mean something totally different to psychopaths in a psychopathic culture. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this, is, this is the final question. And uh, this one has to do with the overall impact of this election, but it's bigger than the election because I'm not one that puts most of my effort into electoral politics. This just happened to be a turning point election. And so effort needed to be put into this one. But if you look at the vote that put Trump out, 20.6 million Latinos voted. And uh, it's almost double the vote before. This, this vote has gone up tremendously. And this is saying something about what the majority of 70% of them voted against Trump. This is saying something about what they think about the disrespect that they've undergone in this country. And if you look at places like Arizona, you've got the Latino and Native American effect coming in to kick Trump hard, you know, hard. Um, so if you look at the Asian vote, Asian Americans, 3.6 million more Asian Americans voted more Asian American um, against um, in this election and most of them, nearly 70% voted against Trump and the Native American vote is even higher. Uh, so, and, and then with blacks, over 19 million blacks voted. And uh, by the way, I should point out because we vote as a block, we're unified, a greater number of us uh, hit on the right side because our divide is less than the other groups because we have a homogenous culture. So my question, and, and this is the final one, and um, Kuji Chagalia, Sister Kuji Chagalia is someone who loves African people. She's into African culture, 
And then she loves African-American culture. And she's got two daughters that look just like her, identical twins, who are into this culture deep, deep in the waters. You know what I mean? And, and like the mama, have got uh, artistic gifts, in this case, singers, you know? And, and the father was a drummer, you know what I mean? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sisters and a beautiful brother. So my question for both of you is, what do you see as the role of African-American culture or new African culture or black culture um, in this new uh, country that is coming into being, which is gonna be a majority people of color in just a few years? In shaping what it should be, not just numerically, what do you see as the role of African-American culture in that? Siri, go ahead and answer the question, and then when Fabia or Kujagalia comes in, you can speak when you're finished. Okay, am I, I, I notice every time my screen is frozen, I think you can hear yeah, me, so hear, I don't. We can hear. Okay. The things that you both talked about, which was wonderful last, on the last episode, was the coming together of Black men with the youth and, the, and I have to have the elders in it, all generations, intergenerational coming together, black men. What we are missing in this country is our tradition of a rite of passage. We taught and educated our children to a seven, three, seven year steps, a 21 year program. right and knew how to be a woman knew how to care for the community so the first was the right of reason then the right of puberty then seven years of the right of maturity we do none of that today and what's worse we minimize this this huge enormous monolith that has kept us together as a culture and we minimize it and trivialize it into weekend events or one month rite of passage which trivializes its power the right of reason takes seven years from the time you were born to the time you reach age seven. We are supposed to be nurturing our children into the right of reason. When we do that, we teach them the difference between right and wrong. We teach them the difference between order and chaos, the difference between pride and insecurity, between respect and disrespect. And remember, we live in a country, number one foundation is disrespect. These are things that we don't learn anymore. Honor over dishonor. Those are the first things children learn. Today, children are learning how to use selfies, how to take pictures, how to trend, how to be wear gold and jewel. The things that make us humane beings, honor, integrity, pride, decency, are not taught. Those are the first lessons we teach children from birth through age seven. Then we go into the right of puberty, where children learn accountability, dependability, productivity, as opposed to consumption and consumerism. We have to learn how to contribute to families and to protect the community. Each child learns that by the time they are 14 years old. Just think how different this country would look if each child learned the right of puberty, the right of reasoning by the time they were 14. And lastly, the right of maturity from age 15 to 21. That's when children are taught marital skills, how to be a good parent, how to be a good father, a good mother, a good nurturer. We are taught parenting skills, how to be a good father, mother, as opposed to also being a good spouse. And lastly, the art of nation building, something that we do not even think about. We think about building our bank accounts, not building our nation. We think about our wardrobe, not our heart, our spirits. We have become very Eurocentric in our thinking. We have alienated ourselves from our culture. That's why we are in the position we are in. The minute we scrape American culture off of us, the insanity of white psychopathy is removed from our minds. Then we can start participating in our true culture, which is the foundation of humanism on this planet. And that's what's going to save the human race. Right on. Siri? Yeah, uh, I think that that's 
that's exactly to build on to the uh, to the point about rites of passage. I think that that's one of the major things that we need is independent black institutions, like independent totally. black institutions, and um, one of the main functions definitely needs to be rites of passage. And I think that's also one of the lessons from the Reconstruction period was that, or the, the betrayal, the great betrayal of Reconstruction, the end of Reconstruction was that we need independent Black institutions and that the support of like mainstream politics, it just goes up, it goes, it comes and it goes. And I think we, we have to expect that to come and go. Like there, there'll be a period where there'll be this emphasis on racial justice and et cetera, et cetera. But soon, soon it'll be gone. And um, it will need those independent black institutions um, for our own good. And also in the times when it, when we have had times like that, like the, whether it be the uh, Great Depression or whether it be the, um, that reconstruction period on my mind, because you brought it up so much uh, lately is that we have had that tradition of responding to those those kind of times uh, with creativity, with entrepreneurship and um, racial ethnic pride. So I, it is in our tradition to do that. Yeah, economic organization is really important uh, at this point, at, at any point. And um, Sister Kujitagalia, she is pointing out the injustices of capitalism and we have other models, communal models, uh, models of uh, cooperative economics that we need to use and to uh, use that and, and the family will be strengthened by it. And I think one of the strongest uh, arms that we have in terms of building up a stronger economy is our culture. We have the culture of popular choice of the United States and the world. And we need to control it. Malcolm made a point about business. And this is one of the chapters missing in uh, the autobiography. And it was that when you build businesses, you're gonna have to be able to protect them. And that has been a problem with black wealth in this country. Anytime it's built, it's taken whether it's through the redevelopment agency tearing down your communities or people running you out of town and taking whatever you have. Um, the Nation of Islam, I think, provided a good model for this when the mafia was coming along, uh, forcing them to pay a tax, which they impose on everybody else. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad called the meeting of the head of organized crime at his, at his mansion and delivered an order. Leave our people alone. The same order was delivered to the mafia when they tried to dictate the contract of Muhammad Ali. And there was one group in this country the mafia feared. It was the, the fruit of Islam and particularly uh, the fruit in prison. They were better than anything that organized crime could put out there and they backed off. So what I'm saying is we have to protect what we put up there and we really need it. Uh, but, but, but the final point, you know, the question was, uh, what do you see the role of African American culture in this shifting demographic where it's going to be a majority people of color by 2040, 2044? And I would suggest that we already have answers for that. If you look at the role of Black liberation movements and the role they have played in the influencing of liberation movements of people of color. Well, it was the Brown Berets who were influenced by the Black Panther Party uh, or the Puerto Rican movement, uh, again, influenced by the Black Panther Party. Uh, or if you look at Black Lives Matter, the way in which various forces in this country have gone into motion um, around uh, our movements, which are expressions of culture. And so I think that uh, at this point in our history, we need to understand that we need our culture to revive us. And his sister, Kujichagalia said, uh, we need to wipe off the whiteness and get into the true 
core of our culture, which is humane and spiritual and oriented towards justice. Uh, but we also need to appreciate this rich culture that we have grounded in the black family. And you need to celebrate this victory that you have and you need to be laying out your demands of what you expect of this administration because um, too often we have been the key to who goes to the White House or the dog house as Malcolm said, but very often the last ones to benefit. So um, I think that that is the question for the future. Siri, you wanted to add, and, and we're gonna wrap up on this, you wanted to add some initiatives that you thought needed to be addressed um, as it affects black males? Um, I think I can save those for, for the next time. Huh? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so what we wanna do now is um, open it up if there are any people that have been watching this that uh, have any comments or questions. Um, feed them in and uh, we can respond. And while Sister Kujitagalia is off right now, we wanna thank her. She had trouble with her computer, but she brought in some real gems of wisdom. Real gems of wisdom. <laughs> Do you have any questions coming in? Um, yeah, so they wanna know um, perhaps in the future a link to your books I guess there's three different people with three different books. They want the links as a part of the YouTube uh, underneath. And um, you got a Carnita Grove saying Hotel for Madagascar by way of Ghana. And uh, um, that's, that, those are some of the comments right now. There's a sister from um, uh, Madagascar by way of Ghana uh, who has watched the previous show and uh, she's sending her greetings. I wanna point out to the sister that on both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side, my people are from Madagascar. And um, I know that from my great aunt who lived to be over 120 years of age, she left that record in the family Bible. And a few years before my mother's death, we were driving across the Bay Bridge and I, you know, my mother had a great memory. So I said, uh, you know what part of Africa we came from? And she said, Mada, Mada, I said, Madagascar? She said, yeah, this is unusual because uh, blacks came into the United States from Madagascar only for a short period of time, um, early part of the 18th century. And Madagascar is an island off of uh, East Africa, Tanzania, not far from Tanzania. And so that meant that Africans who were taken in that region, that was a part of the Arab slave trade tying into the European slave trade. So uh, sister from Madagascar by way of Ghana, uh, we have more in common than you think. Mm -hmm. Another question. Uh, sister Kujichagalia mentioned rite of passage programs. Can we know more about that? A question came in on rites of passage programs that sister Kujichagalia referred to uh, can you tell us more about rites of passage programs? Siri? Am I still? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I, I really cannot stress this enough. 21 years, not 21 hours, not 21 days, not 21 months. Traditional rites of passage three seven year programs. So yes, there are many, I've seen many, many, many so-called rites of passage programs. They are not traditional in the fact that everything that needs to be under, overstood within those 21 years cannot possibly happen in one weekend, one month or so forth and so on. Please make sure that you yourself in your home with your family, you can have your own rites of passage program. You have to remember that the most important person in your life is in the mirror. You have all the power to do everything you need as long as you read and get the information. So in your home, you start a rites of passage program with your family, with your children. And if you are actually going to go through all of these steps, it's not gonna happen in one weekend. This takes quite a while for this to occur.
but please start one of your own. One of my books I wrote with Brother um, Dr. Lodge Daly and Brother Robert Woods was The Elephant in the Room. And in that um, book, I have an article about rites of passage, how it works, and how you establish it. Um, there are many books, though, uh, traditional books that were written by our people and historians that have rites of passage in them. If you are really interested, I can send you a, what is it, copies? Do people still do that? A copy of that page so you can have all the information. I can forward it to Dr. Uh, Oba Sashaka and he can have it available on the next show. I will write it up for you. But definitely, this is takes a long time. It's an intense program. This is not an overnight thing that happens. So please be weary of people you see in the community with a weekend rites of passage program or a one month rites of passage program. We have been indoctrinated with white psychopathy for 528 years in this country. It is not going to be eliminated in one weekend. Very good. Uh, Siri, you got anything you want to add to that? No, I think that that's it. Quite clear. You know, another part because uh, Sister Kujichagalia is stressing the fact that depth is what's required in rites of passage programs. And I would say that that's true for any programs that involve transformation in our communities. And one of the things that's really key in rites of passage transformation is identity transformation. Hmm. Very, very important. And uh, a guy named Bulu Lelu Wabogo and myself, we've identified the stages that Black people go through when they're waking up. There are stages I went through, Malcolm went through, Amakar Cabral, who you see in the back here, this guy with the sunglasses on, went through. And this is a transformation from the stage of um, mental incarceration psychological lynching that we call assimilation that takes you through to the stages of true African love, African identity, and for those that want to revolutionary African consciousness. Now for kids, this is good for taking them through the basic levels, but the people who teach it, they have to practice it because this only works when the people who are doing the teaching are doing the living. So uh, that's a key component of it. But what uh, Sister Kujichagalia referred to as weekend programs won't work, that is absolutely correct. And it's gotta be transformational. Okay, that's it. Uh, those were good questions. I really wanna thank uh, Sister Kujichagalia one of the baddest revolutionaries around, which by the way, good revolutionaries bring beauty into the world. And I That's right. That this sister doesn't only manifest it physically, but she manifests it spiritually, psychologically, philosophically, as Kwame Torre, who was a good friend of mine, former head of the All African People's Revolutionary Party used to say, ready for the revolution. And, uh, mm. Sister Kuji Chagalia is one that is ready for the revolution. And she has raised some beautiful daughters who are also raising them some beautiful children. And if you check them out, they're on Facebook regularly <laughs> teaching the truth. And she is definitely about freeing your mind so your behind will follow from what she <laughs> calls racist psychopathy or whatever it is. That brainwashing <laughs> that has put us to sleep. So, sister, yes. I really want to thank you. You know, I love you. And oh, thank you, thank you. And you know, and since I was a student in back in San Francisco, San Francisco State, oh, almost forty years ago. But I know I'm making you proud, my brother, because you make me proud every day. <laughs> you better believe it. And I, I don't know, you don't know nothing to me for that. That was your choice. But it's so good <laughs> to see. Uh, a beautiful light like you, shining your light. You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Your light has been shining. It's just plain beautiful. And Dr. Siri McDougal, um, this is a brother who, as uh, Sister Kujichagalia, both of you embody what you're talking about. You're not just talking it, you're walking it. 
And uh, I said this before, this is a uh, outstanding brother. And he's outstanding because most importantly, he's got a great character. And then of course, a brilliant mind. We got a lot of brilliant minds out there whose characters are not in line with the mind. Yeah. When that alignment is there, then that's a good thing to see. And he's yes. got, got him a lovely wife who's putting a smile on his face. There were times <laughs> when he didn't, he didn't have that smile on his face. <laughs> that has been taken care of. So right. I, I want to thank both of you. Um, this has been enjoyable. And I hope thank everybody you. gets something from this. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank yeah. you both. Dr. Obatashaka is the author of five books, each of which is considered a masterwork. His first book grew out of his organizing in the Black Freedom Movement, entitled The Political Legacy of Malcolm X. Dr. Tashaka's books on Malcolm X covers Dimensions Missed by Alex Haley's autobiography. And unlike Manning Marable's book, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, which argues that Malcolm abandoned black nationalism by reinventing himself with a false narrative of his life. Dr. Tashaka examines Malcolm's thoughts and shows that Malcolm did not reinvent himself. He transformed himself and remained not only a black nationalist, but broadened his revolutionary philosophy while working to radicalize the civil rights movement into a human rights movement. In this analysis, Tashaka combines activism with scholarship and allows Malcolm to speak for himself. The Art of Leadership, Volume 1 and 2, are Oba Tashaka's second and third books. They are the only books in the modern world today on African and African American leadership traditions and systems. These two volumes are used in black studies departments, seminary programs, churches, and community organizations in Africa, Britain, Holland, and the Caribbean, and throughout the United States. Tashaka's fourth book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality is considered by scholars to be a classic because it is the only book to accurately define the paradigm or model for African and African American families. This is a paradigm that will provide balance for black and non-black male-female relationships. Dr. Tashaka's fifth book, The Integration Trap, specifically the generation gap caused by a choice between two cultures, explains what has gone wrong in black families, communities, and nations since 1968 that has led to shifts in black values and behavior not arising from enslavement. Tashaka shows that since 1968, powerful hostile forces have hit black communities and African nations, causing them to make a choice between two cultures, one African-American and one European-American. This book examines African and African-American culture in depth with a focus on how to rescue African-American communities nationally and African nations globally. Currently, Dr. Tashaka is writing his sixth and seventh books, tentatively entitled Siba, Mastering Your Inner Light of Wisdom. This book covers the pedagogy or teaching method used in ancient African cultures and African-American cultures to produce masters in all walks of life.